Greetings. Welcome back to the Green Garden Guy Show. Today, I would like to discuss seeds and seedlings. It's that time of year. Everybody seems to be doing a lot of planting just about everywhere. If you haven't been flooded out or blown out of town by a tornado or something, uh, most of us are heading out towards the garden at this time of the year. Somewhere between April and June is typical in the mainland. Uh, here we're always active at it so uh, I think timing is good to talk about seeds and seedlings I get questions about this all the time and I'm also uh, helping people with issues that tend to be created too uh, with their seeds and seedlings so I'd like to start with just a few basic rules okay and Rule number one, a seed, when you're putting it into the ground or into a flower pot, a seed does not require fertilizer. This is important in many cases. Now, <clears throat> the reason I say that is because the seed has contained inside of it, in the embryo, in the cotyledons, it has food. It's been stored by the parent plant for that little embryo seedling. And so until the seedling sprouts, puts a root down into the soil, and then opens up the true leaves. The first ones that open are usually referred to as cotyledons, and then the second set that comes are the true leaves. When the true leaves come, the plant is now seeking some sort of food. All right. But until that point, food in the soil around the seed is usually counterproductive, undesirable, and sometimes downright dangerous. Um, and so I'd like to dispel the idea that we fertilize our seeds. I never fertilize seeds. Okay. I also never fertilize cuttings until they've started to push roots because they're just not going to take the stuff up. Um, all right, so there's rule number one. Seeds don't need fertilizer. Rule number two. Rule number two is plants, seeds, and seedlings know exactly what they're doing. They're perfect machines, perfect biological organisms that can reproduce themselves almost exactly time after time after time over and over again. They are well beyond human technology and understanding as far as how this really goes because we can't make a seed. Not really. Not in the way that plants do it. So maybe one of these days that may occur, but for the meantime, the seed is down near a miracle as far as we're concerned. It's perfect, and it doesn't really require much intervention from human beings. This is important. Humans are doers. They're always, oh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and we're going to go to Mars, and we're going to build a Ford car. We're going to do whatever we're going to do, you know. Uh, but uh, seeds don't really require much of that. For a gardener to get the seed up and growing into a plant, the only thing the gardener really has to do is introduce some sort of medium to place the seed on, hopefully the right one. You will have to put some moisture into the medium so that the seed decides that it's okay to grow now, and the seed will generally require light. Temperature is also another factor. Proper temperature range, proper light, enough moisture, and some sort of medium to grow in. Past that, may much anything that seed requires from us. And if we start thinking that we need to do this or do that, we're probably going to mess up. That's <laughs> what's going to happen to us. All right. So, rule number two. Seeds know exactly what they're doing. I'd like to introduce... A third rule right up front here and that is that I often hear from people when they're confronted with a seed that has a hard coat on the outside they look at that and they go oh I I should crack that the seed will get out easier if I crack that well as again it's more of this human doing stuff it's busyness um, you know what makes people think that a seed isn't capable of getting out of its own coat by itself? That's 
kind of an odd idea in my mind. Now, it's true. There are things we can do to seeds in some cases that will speed up their ability to germinate and grow. This is true. And so terms like uh, scarification, which means scratching or nicking a seed coat, not removing it, but scratching or nicking it, will allow moisture to get in and break dormancy. Seeds are sometimes soaked in certain types of chemicals. Uh, gibberellic acid uh, is one that comes from a fungi that on really difficult to germinate seeds. Sometimes people will use that, and it can speed up the germination time. Also, a lot of tough to germinate seeds. Uh, you can use a hot water treatment and put the seeds in a bath of water, maybe about 140 degrees, let them cool down in there overnight, and then plant them the next day. That also can help. But I, I wish to dispel the idea that, like, if you have a macadamia nut, for instance, which has what heck of a seed coat, or, you know, some of the big tropical seeds like an abiu or a green sapote or a mame, where you have this nice shell over the outside, almost as heavy as an eggshell, the seeds are able to crack that on their own. They, if you place them right, they're going to take care of it. You don't need to worry about it. Studies uh, from the University of Hawaii on sprouting macadamia nut seeds indicated that seeds that had been cracked by the grower prior to planting uh, were usually an 80% loss. So if you wish to see a huge mortality in your seeds, just go ahead and start trying to crack the coats. They'll do it on their own. In my opinion, those three basic concepts, um, seeds don't need fertilizer, Seeds don't generally need much human intervention to get them going. And number three, if it's got a hard seed coat, generally you're not going to try to crack and remove it. Okay, uh, That's generally the best rules as far as seeds are concerned. Um, things will probably work out if you avoid all three of those. Uh, you know, I have had people tell me that they took... Uh, uh, seedlings and made up a mix that was like lime and chicken manure and then put the things in there and then they call me and they ask why are my seedlings dying well you fried them okay um, so let's start off with talking about medium that is the material that goes around the seed right here I have a young potted Abiu. This is one of those delicious Amazonian fruits. Now the Abiu has right here a hard seed coat. The coat's pretty thick. This is one half of it. The other half's down there in the soil. I just pulled that off the side of the cotyledons right here. It came loose on its own now because the seed has germinated and split this clean in two you can see it's been split in half all right so right there don't worry about the seed coat plants won't take care of that now as far as the medium is concerned in this flower pot what I have is pretty much a combination of milled sphagnum peat moss and perlite a few other things in there. It's a commercial medium. Uh, this is probably sunshine mix that's in here, although sometimes I use Promix. Lately I've been using a product called Sun Grow. So the medium that we use when sprouting a seed should be inert and relatively sterile. Now, I don't believe in sterilizing soils. I've seen terrible things happen when soils have been sterilized by heat, for instance. Usually what will occur is once they've been removed, cooled down, and you plant in them, the first thing that hits the soil tends to be what takes off in it and grows after it's been sterilized. A lot of times those will be some of the most hostile organisms, the most advantageous organisms. Um, and so I don't suggest sterilizing soils. It's not something I do. Uh, on the other hand, using mediums that just don't grow a lot of different organisms, 
uh, are the way I approach this. Like I say, uh, sphagnum moss was used uh, by Native Americans, and it was also used by uh, surgeons in the Civil War. When they ran out of gauze and they ran out of cotton for uh, bandages, they would take sphagnum moss and apply it on wounds uh, as a dressing. Uh, Native Americans did this. Uh, they also used it for diapers uh, in ancient America, the sphagnum moss. And so it's a rather clean, sterile material that very few things really grow in it. Uh, that is, as far as microbes and fungi, there's not a lot, a few, but not a lot. And so generally you don't have any harmful or hostile pathogens when you're using a medium like that. Um, it is available in stores, in the nurseries and such, usually labeled as seed starting mix, whatever brand you're looking at, okay? Uh, but it'd be called seed starting mix. That's what you really want to be using instead of a potting soil, all right? Um, if you have access to uh, large-scale wholesale commercial growing supplies, uh, then you can probably hunt down ProMix, Sunshine Mix, or SunGrow, which is pretty much the same thing as a lot of the seed starting mixes sold, although they're probably not as finely graded. Okay, they won't be as fine as the stuff you'll get in a bag, but they work just fine. They work on seeds, and they work on cuttings. Okay, so... Materials are dampened first. Usually by them they're dry and baled. Uh, so you dampen them in the pots and once they're dampened then you place your seeds into the pots or your cuttings, whatever you're working with, um, goes into the medium. Now, in the case of most of our agricultural seeds that we grow, so like, you know, corn or sunflowers or tomatoes, this type of thing, uh, those seeds are not very picky, all right? You can put them into a medium that's heavy in fertilizer. Corn will come up through uh, piles of chicken manure often. Enough chicken manure that would fry a pepper plant. Usually corn can manage to get through the stuff. Um, and so it's not as important with our standard garden seeds that the mediums be completely inert as it is with some of the more exotic seed, cacti seeds, tropical plant seeds, maybe some of our fruit seeds and things like this are, are far better off in inert mediums. Um, you can take a good quality potting soil, and I mean a good quality one, and there's a lot of garbage out there. Uh, <laughs> All right, and some of the major brand names are about as much junk as some of the lowest price bargain basement stuff, too. Um, and I, as far as buying a potting soil in a bag, um, most things that are made by Kellogg Cascade are pretty good stuff. Uh, Kellogg Cascade has a uh, special line um, called uh, um, G and B, and it stands for Gardener and Bloom. Uh, it's kind of like the organic, uh, natural soil line. That stuff's pretty good. <clears throat> Generally, if it's just garden seeds, you're going to find that a high-quality potting soil will work. All right. I, myself, I generally don't use potting soils for seeds. I, they're, they're for potting. <laughs> That's, so when you've got a plant and you're going to transplant it into a container, that's what those materials are for. They're not usually quite right exactly for seeds, particularly when they're uh, uh, difficult seeds. Difficult seeds are not good in potting soils to start them. I have other questions from people about, well, when do I transplant? Well, I don't know. Let's take a look here. Here we are in, uh, in, in, in Bill's nursery. We have a wonderland of seedlings. This right here is a balloon chili, uh, the bishop's cap, Capsicum baccatum from South America. If we turn the pot over and we look underneath right here, you'll see that there are some roots poking out. Well, that means that the plant is pretty much rooted to the bottom of the container. Now, one thing that I want to encourage others to do don't ever hesitate to slide a pot off and have a look underneath. This seems to be something that people want to, they don't want to take the pots off. They're afraid something's going to happen. But now when we take a plant out of a pot though, we don't 
grab it by the stem and yank. All right, now sometimes you got a tree, it's got really good, strong bark on it. Yeah, you could probably do that. But we're talking about vegetable seedling here right now. It's not a good idea to handle vegetable seedlings by their stems. And if the seedlings are really tiny, like this guy right here, a nice, cute little fuzzy stalk. If I grabbed hold of that, I'm going to bruise it. I'll literally leave damage on the side of that tender little stem. And, of course, when you have damage, then organisms can get in there. Maybe maybe the thing damps off and dies because of what it did. At least it will be set back a bit. So we take two fingers here. I got the uh, first and second fingers wrapped around the side of the stem. I turn everything upside down like that. Then I take my other hand and I go like that on the top of the pot. If one time didn't do it, then we do it again. There we go. There it comes. All right. Just look at all them roots, right? You can see here, they're crawling around the bottom. This plant is well meshed into its soil. Uh, as you can see, it's perfect for transplanting. It's not going to fall apart when you throw it in the ground. It's either has to go out into the garden and start spreading, or this plant needs to go, say, into a gallon container. This plant is ready to either be sold out of the nursery and taken to somebody's garden, or it's time to get it into a bigger pot. Um, I would like to see it sold. I don't want to transplant it to a bigger pot. Come on down. I have had questions from people about when do I transplant. That's very common. Well, we're already halfway there. You look. <laughs> That's how you figure out when. Not all plants are the same. Some of these plants are going to take a lot longer in a pot. All right. Um, some of them are more tolerant to root binding. Cacti, succulents, for instance, bound soil is good with them. They like it. Uh, they don't like overly large pots. Big pots make them drown. Okay. So you want your cacti and succulents relatively pot bound. On the other hand, here we have ourselves a beautiful tree tomato. Uh, Cypomandra batacea, the, uh, uh, it's called tamarillo uh, sometimes. Anyway, this guy right here, I don't even need to ask too many questions about is this ready for transplanting. This right here is roots dangling out of the bottom of the pot. This thing is definitely ready to either get in your garden or for me to put it in a gallon container and uh, uh, shift it up to the next table here in the nursery. And so, just looking at the bottom of a pot a lot of times is going to tell you a whole lot. Now, don't be afraid to have to trim that off. When this comes out of the pot, most of that's going to rip off. And it's not a problem. You can take a pair of scissors to it. Uh, most plants tolerate uh, a certain amount of disruption to the root system without any problems at all. Now, there are a few that are more picky about it. Uh, passion vines don't like their roots being disturbed. Bougainvilleas, for instance, don't like their roots being disturbed. There are plants out there that too much disruption of the root is going to cause a problem. But most plants, eh, you can tear off part of the roots and nothing's going to hurt. As a matter of fact, if you open up your pot and you see the roots have been going around and around like a bushel basket, you want to get in there and rip at them. Now, some people score with a knife or a pruning shear. Me, I just take my hand like this and go down the side and kind of rip off some of the roots so the soil opens up again. That prunes them off clean on the end so they're not going around, and so when they're put in the ground, they start to go out like this. That's all. Let's talk about pot size. Generally... I like to work with three and a half or four inch pots. These are typical. Sometimes I use six packs. Depends on what it is. With vegetables, I will use a six pack configuration because it saves space. Um, but for the most part, this is what I use. And this is also very much a standard in the industry, too, that people are using somewhere between three and a half and four inch pots for so many of the bedding plant transplants. Now, as you see, the, the plants fill the pots up. And if you're not going out into the garden with that plant and you intend to transplant it to a larger container, well, we will usually choose what is typically the next pot size up. And 
in the industry, the one gallon nursery pot doesn't really hold a gallon, of, so don't even challenge it, all right? But that's what we tend to call this thing. And so the conventional black plastic uh, nursery pot is typically the next place that a plant will go. After it fills in this pot, if it's still in a container, usually the next thing that happens is we'll use a two gallon, like this. Uh, and then after that, there are three gallon pots. There are the standard five gallon pots, which are your typical fairly large nursery pots. Um, and they go seven gallons and they go to uh, 10 gallons and 15 gallons and on and on and on and on. Okay, so it's pretty much pre prescribed for you already that where the plant goes. Uh, they figured this stuff out. And so if you just buy the next pot size, you're usually in the right place. Um, the uh, important issue is, and again, I hear people saying, well, why can't, you know, if I have a tomato seed and I want to grow it on a 55-gallon drum, you know, why can't I just plant that seed right inside the uh, the drum, you know? Well, well, with a tomato seed, you probably get by. It'll probably work. But with other seeds that are a lot pickier, harder to grow, and so forth, um, you will probably find that you're holding way too much moisture in a container that's overly large. And so small plants, small pots. Large plants, large pots. Medium-sized plants, medium pots. If you try to expand too fast, take a tiny plant, put it in an overly large container, quite often it will rot and die. It just isn't enough root system in the soil to pull out all the moisture that can accumulate in there. So you keep your pots sized to, the, to your plants. Another thing that has come up over the years is questions about uh, how deep the seeds or where the seeds go, how do you handle seeds, you know. Now, most seeds do not come with an instruction manual on them. Sometimes the packages uh, will have good information. Sometimes the websites where you got your seeds will have good information about growing. But in general, when you're looking at a seed and you want to plant it, when it's an agricultural type seed, usually just putting it into the soil, the depth of the largest seed dimension will work. So if I'm growing a corn seed in a three and a half inch pot, for instance, the corn seed uh, at the best is, you know, what, quarter to a half an inch, right? All right. So that's how deep it goes under the soil in most cases. Now, if I got a problem with birds and I'm putting that stuff in way out in the field someplace right into the earth, I'm pushing it in deeper than that. Conditions are not as good out there in the field. Things may try to pull the seedling up, etc., etc. And so uh, the corn seed is capable of being installed pretty deep in the ground and making it to the top. Um, I highly recommend that most agricultural type seeds be planted at the depth that is the dimension of the largest measurement of that seed. That's a good rule of thumb. It works with most things. On the other hand, really, really fine seed, very small seeds like some cactus seed, for instance, uh, dragon fruit even, which isn't that small, but it's pretty small. Uh, a lot of cacti seed, a lot of herb seed. If you're growing herbs from seed like thyme or oregano, for instance, all that stuff belongs on the surface of the soil. You do not want to bury tiny, fine seeds. Time seed is quite a bit like dust, and if you put it under the surface, it will probably never make it to the top. You dampen your medium, you take the seeds, you sprinkle them over the top of the medium, you press the medium down a little bit on the seeds, either by your hand or you can water it in with a mister, just to kind of compact the top a little bit. And that's it. You're done. Uh, you can use saran over the tops if you're in a rather dry environment. Uh, beware of using saran, though, if you're putting it out in light. If it's in strong sunlight, you're going to make a solar collector and you're going to burn everything under the saran. So, you know, if you're using saran, make sure it's in very uh, diffused light. 
Otherwise, just put it out someplace where it's not going to dry out too fast. Uh, if it starts to dry out, miss the top a little bit. Uh, for really fine seeds, laid on the top is best. Uh, in the case of Abu, you can see here in both of these, my Kyledons are right there near the top. That's the green thing there coming out of the seed down below. I planted these on the surface of the soil laying sideways. And I do that with a lot of larger tropical seeds. You know, seeds for mame sapote, for green sapote, for abius, for egg fruits, and I don't know. Pretty good sized seeds, most of them. Pretty good sized coat. I just put them right on top. They do just fine that way. And there's an awful lot of seeds that will do fine. Laid on their sides, pushed halfway into the soil. An avocado seed is one that works that way, too. Seeds do not generally have to be buried you know, to come up. They do need to have some moisture. But now, let's talk about watering seeds. This is something else that seems to go wrong frequently. Uh, people will just saturate the poor things with water. Well, it doesn't take much water to get a seed to come up. Studies have shown that most seed will germinate at the permanent wilting moisture of a mature plant. So a tomato seed will actually crack and start to grow in soil that is so dry that a parent plant would die from drought. All right, so most seed does not take very much moisture. It needs a little bit to get it in the thought process, the idea that it's, oh, I'm damp, we're going to start to grow, you know. But saturating seeds so they don't have oxygen around them don't work out at all. You Sometimes that keeps the seed from sprouting completely. Too much water will do that. It can make the seeds rot, too. Um, and so... I usually water my soils before I plant my seeds, put the seeds in them, I'll put some water over the top or let the rain hit them so to pack the seed down into the soil and settle everything. And in a lot of cases, at least here in Hawaii, I don't rewater again until the seed starts to come up and grow. Now in California, oftentimes the seeds would begin to dry out due to the weather. Um, before they were germinated, so I'll go by and periodically see that the soil is dampened, but soil doesn't need to be wet all the way to the top. That's the other issue. When judging your soil moisture, you want to judge a little bit below the below the surface. You know, if you, you don't need it to be wet all the way up. If you do that, you'll probably get fungus, you'll probably get fungus gnats, little black guys that'll fly all over the place on you. There'd be a lot of things that you won't like if you have too much water in your soil. So it doesn't take very much. Yeah, that, that may not be all I know about seeds, but this morning it's all I can remember. So let's try to recap here. Um, the seeds do not require fertilizer to germinate. You only start fertilizing the pots once the plants begin to develop true leaves. Okay, this is a very good idea. Um, seeds in general um, do not require much human intervention. If you find yourself feeling like you need to crack your seeds or mess around with the seeds or do things like that, generally speaking, that's counterproductive unless you have a special seed that is well known in the literature to benefit from certain types of treatments. But that isn't most seeds. Okay. Generally, messing around with the seeds doesn't make them any happier. Um, you want to make sure that you're using mediums in the pots that are relatively sterile. And so, generally speaking, manures in pots and things like this are a no-no. Okay. Um, so you want to use uh, either very, very good quality potting soils and a lot of your basic garden seeds are okay. Otherwise, a seed starting mix or a professional grower's mix is the way to go. Um, seeds don't need much moisture to germinate. Okay, this is really important. Don't soak those poor things to death. Just a little bit of moisture in the pot is all they need. All right. Uh, seeds have requirements both in temperature, 
in light, in moisture, and in time. Don't get impatient. There's a lot of seeds out there. For instance, if you want to grow a cone of coffee, well, you'd spend six months waiting to see that seed come up out of the ground. If you want to grow pawpaw seeds, pawpaw seeds that are taken from the fruit and planted in September or October one year, they aren't even going to see them begin to break the ground until maybe May to July the next year. It's true with a lot of seeds that require cold treatment. Uh, Overpotting, another problem. Make sure that small plants, small seeds, small pots. Checking the bottoms of your plants so whether they need to be transplanted or not. Don't hesitate to take them out of the containers. All right, Have a look. See what's going on. You can learn a lot by pulling a plant out of a pot sometimes. It'll tell you everything. Uh, you know, make sure the containers have good drainage, too. That's very important. Um, anyway, aloha. Happy gardening. I hope you have a wonderful spring this year. Hang loose. Don't overwater the seeds.